Uh, thank you for having me. I, uh, I wasn't given a whole lot of instruction for this talk other than at AGU they want to hear about some of the things you're doing at NASA. And, and that certainly goes both ways. I may be, in fact, the newest member of AGU. I actually joined AGU yesterday. But I was... <laughs> When I, when, I was, uh, when I was thinking about this talk, I was like, damn, I've got to get around to joining AGU. Um, I, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a background as, as to why that may be. But I, I thought today, since we only have about 45 minutes, and I unfortunately don't have time to talk about all of the great new results that are going on at NASA, I sort of had a, a two paths. I could have gone telling you about a lot of overlap between AGU and NASA, and the stuff that we do, the planetary science, the Earth science, or I could tell you about some really different stuff that maybe as scientists you might just have a little fun having your mind blown on, a, uh, on an afternoon like this. So uh, I went a little bit more that way. I'll, I'll start by saying off that this, this is about having fun and then exchanging some current scientific topics. Um, a lot of times scientists don't know each other's jargon. Um, I started out as an astrophysicist and now I'm more of a spokesperson for all of NASA and somebody uh, the other day raised their hand and said, can you tell me the difference between Hadley cells on Earth and on Jupiter? And I kind of looked at them blankly and said, Hadley cells? So. Um, if, if I say anything that you don't understand or a term that you don't know, please feel free to raise your hand. Let, let's, just, let's just talk about this. Um, I, it may seem like modern astrophysics is getting more and more strange. You've probably heard that we now believe the universe is about 99% made of something that we have no idea what it is. And um, I thought I would talk a little bit about how it got that bad and, and how we might be trying to solve that problem. A little bit about who I am. Um, I'm actually an astrophysicist by training. That's my, my doctorate. It's in uh, the spectroscopy of massive stars and the atmospheres of massive stars, magnetohydrodynamic coding, all that great stuff. Um, I did a lot of research on observatories all around the world. I've been a user of Hubble, uh, the Keck telescope, a lot of other things. Uh, about 10 years ago, I started accidentally doing television shows. And I really mean that accidentally. I was working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And I think just being close to Hollywood, they kind of grabbed any young woman and said, go talk to people. And um, I ended up on three different television shows. If, if, if the show has the word universe in the title, I'm probably on it. Um, <laughs> I'm on the History Channel's universe show, uh, the National Geographic's The Known Universe, How the Universe Works on Discovery Channel. And I also do a lot of podcasting for NASA as well. Uh, that's me and my robot companion there, one of my favorite podcasts. Um, these days, as assistant director of science at Goddard, I actually do represent all four of NASA's science divisions, which is earth science, planetary science, uh, astrophysics, and heliophysics and space weather. So I need to learn a lot more about earth science. I'm getting educated pretty well these days, but I'm hoping to make it out to my first AGU meeting uh, this December. So I've got a lot to learn. So. <laughs> Please, please educate me. I think I'll definitely need to do that. Okay, um, I think I'll start then by, by, by talking about the current problems in larger scale astronomy and a little bit of how they might dovetail with some of the things going on in AGU. Um, this is a galaxy. I think a lot of you are familiar with that idea. This is a, a collection of about, usually about half a trillion stars. And uh, this is a spiral galaxy. It looks very much like the galaxy we live in called the Milky Way. Um, if, if this were the Milky Way, uh, the center of the galaxy is about here. We're about two thirds of the way from the center, uh, right between two little spiral arms on the edge of one. And uh, the scale of our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across the disk. And 100,000 light years, I think you're familiar with the idea that light travels at 186,000 miles per second. Uh, at that speed, 100,000 years across the disk, one light year about 6 trillion miles. The, um, the thing that I, I think most people don't get viscerally is the scale of galaxies. Because a lot of times you sort of see these little points of light and you think, okay, that's a star. You know, that maybe that's about the size of the sun. Maybe this is hundreds or thousands of times bigger than the sun. I, I think a lot of you probably understand it's much bigger than that. The, uh, the closest analogy I could come up with is that the sun could fit about a million Earths inside it, volume-wise. Um, compare the sun to the size of a typical spiral galaxy. Um, if you think about the sun being the size of a 12-point dot on an eye, so regular 12-point text, dot of an eye, um, a million Earths, if you could fit that inside the dot of an eye, then a galaxy would be about the size of the continental United States from Los Angeles to New York. So if you think about flying over from LA to New York, seeing a book on the ground somewhere with a dot of an eye, that's actually a little bit too small. But if I tried to get much bigger than that, we don't really process those ideas. 
The disks of galaxies are full of dust, and uh, in this dust we find all kinds of wonderful organics, uh, everything from buckyballs to micro diamonds to acetylenes to alcohols. I mean, every, all of the building blocks of life are present in the dust that, that fills this huge volume of the, of the disk of a galaxy. And that dust comes from the life cycle of stars. This is a, a dying star. The, these are uh, mainly images from the Hubble Space Telescope. Everything I'm showing you is, is, is public NASA imagery, so you can download any of this. Um, this is actually a star similar to the sun that is currently dying and unraveling and losing all of its gas and material back into space. It's called a planetary nebula. And uh, these things are wonderful sources of this rich organic dust that we find uh, between the stars. The star is somewhere down here in this, this little belt, and the, and the magnetic field is sort of helping these big lobes sweep up like that and constrained by this little dusty disk here. May have been a part of a solar system once as the star unravels. Uh, that's probably what we'll look like in about five billion years from now. And then, of course, that, that dust gets mixed back into the galaxy, and that's where new stars and planets form. And this is actually another dust cloud taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Instead of a dying star, these are stars being born. Uh, we normally look for stars being born because they go through an unstable period, and they form little jets off their poles. So deep in this dust cloud, you can't really even see inside the dust yet, uh, these jets tell us there's a young star forming right there. And this object, too, as well as a jet coming from inside the cloud. And uh, somewhere, of course, the leftover dust forms planets. And that's where AGU takes over. So I guess I, I know there's, there's a lot more dovetail than that. But, but so that, that's sort of the origin of this dust. Now, um, a lot of astronomers are, 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 have a hard time talking to the public about just how dense and difficult to see through space is, because space seems very, very empty, trillions of times less dense than the air in this room. Uh, but this is a galaxy seen edge on. And when, when you look through 100,000 light years, even very, very thin rarefied dust, that dust just absorbs all of the light. And um, so we, you know, we live, here's the center of the galaxy, we'd be living right about here. We have to look through about 30,000 light years of dust to see into the middle of our galaxy. And in the middle of the galaxy, there's a huge bulge of, of you know, millions of stars very closely packed in there. But you, you don't see that in the sky anywhere. And the reason is because we have to look through that much dust. And, and, and all of the light from the center of the galaxy gets absorbed by the dust, all of the visible light. Things uh, have been getting a lot better with the use of infrared surveys. So it's just to sort of compare uh, what, what visible light looks like, this is the direction of the center of the galaxy in the night sky in visible light. It's actually in the constellation Sagittarius. And um, you can see that every tiny little speck you see here is a star. You look through clouds of, of, of billions of stars as you look in toward the center of the galaxy. And all of this dark material you see is that, is that dust, that, that beautiful rich dust I was talking about. And um, between the stars and the dust, you don't see into the center to really understand what our own galaxy is doing, where, what our place in the galaxy is. So this was an infrared survey done by the Spitzer Space Telescope. And this actually, uh, this sort of weird stripped image is actually pretty much the whole disk of our Milky Way galaxy. If you connect the strips end to end and just wind them all the way around yourself, you're actually looking from your, our, our perspective in the Milky Way galaxy out. And uh, we paid particular attention to the center of the galaxy. Here's the, the center bit, a little bit wider on the survey. Uh, we actually printed out a version of this map. The, this, this map actually is a mosaic of about 800,000 images. And we actually printed out a version that was about 40 feet long by 5 feet wide. We bring it to museums. You can see it at the Adler Planetarium. So uh, we are looking, in, in the infrared, heat radiation gets through dust much better than visible light. It's actually the reason why most fire departments have infrared cameras these days. You, know, you think an infrared or a heat sensitive camera could see like where the fire is, but, but that's not why they use them. They use them because they can see right through dust, right through smoke. So in this map, we can actually see for the first time in, in, this, in this resolution clear across our own galaxy. And there are clouds of star-forming regions. There, there are features in here that we're still cataloging. We're still naming. I mean, it's going to be a long, long time before we even get through that image. 
um, focusing in sort of on, on where this shows us we are in the galaxy. Um, this is an artist's conception of our own galaxy based on that data, based on the map I just showed you. And this was surprising to us. Uh, as I said, the, the sun's about here, kind of off the, uh, the cusp of a little spiral arm. And if you notice, there, there's a circular grid drawn onto this image. And the very first circle right here is actually how far you can see out in visible light in our own galaxy. It was actually an interesting historical problem to even prove that we were in a spiral galaxy. We can only see out to just the next spiral arm in visible light. Uh, with infrared, we see all the way through. And some of the surprises is that the Milky Way is a, what we call a barred spiral. The, 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 the center is elongated or in a bar. And that's actually from the orbits of stars sort of elongating right here. And there are only two bright spiral arms. Uh, this again, we, we didn't expect this because in radio wavelengths you see four spiral arms. So there's basically four spiral arms but only two formed stars. The others are just gas, which you can see in radio wavelengths. No idea why. This is the very central light year of the galaxy in infrared. So using heat light to look all the way through the dust, uh, this is what you see. And uh, to give you a sense, okay, so there's six light months, that, that little bar right there. So that's about three trillion miles. And um, it, it's, it's a wonderful comparison because the closest star to us is four light years away in our part of the galaxy. But in the center of the galaxy, you have thousands of stars packed inside a similar volume. And you know, each little uh, dot you see here is a, is a, is a, is a specific star. You know, we, we see some hot gas as well. Um, what I'm going to do is actually show you some time-lapse observations of what the stars at the very center of the galaxy are doing. So this little box here, I'm, I'm going to show you a blow-up of the box. And I'm going to run a bit of a time lapse to show you the motion of the stars. Now, it's worth mentioning, um, these stars are, are, are much, much smaller. These are not, this is not a resolved image. You're looking at sort of a, a, a blurred out part where, where the, the light from the star is just kind of blurring out our detector. So don't, uh, don't assume that these are physically the size of the stars. OK, um, this is the image. This is real data. This was taken by uh, Andrea Getz at UCLA. She started uh, more than 10 years ago. And I'm going to just run this as a. Uh, a movie. So uh, st starting in the early 90s, she noticed the stars were doing some pretty dramatic things. Uh, the crosshair is, is the very center of the galaxy. And uh, all of the stars near that are just whipping around it. They're orbiting around almost like planets or even comets. And the implied mass needed to get huge stars, these are stars actually bigger than the sun, to do these orbits. You need about, about 4 million times the mass of the sun right here. And you, you may have noticed there's not much radiation coming from there. So definitely not four million stars. That's our central black hole. And uh, we're, we're, we've been doing uh, animations of the star's behavior. Uh, this is a, just an animation based on the data, a little more three-dimensional, of uh, some stars that are all kind of buzzing around that central black hole like a hive of an angry bees. Some of them are getting so close that uh, I actually tried to do a podcast on this. This is a little hard to talk about. Uh, there's an effect called frame dragging. A black hole is a dead star. It's a gravitational bottomless pit. And uh, despite there being no surface to a black hole, black holes can rotate. And they can actually whip space and time around with them. It's called frame dragging. And uh, if any of you guys are fans of something called Gravity Pro B, uh, we actually launched a satellite of wonderfully reflective spheres going around the Earth, measuring this effect. As the Earth turns, it actually takes space and time with it, uh, just a little bit. A black, a black hole has much more mass than the Earth, of course. And uh, some of these stars are actually getting boosted a little bit in their, in their energy in the orbits, because space and time is going around with the black hole. Wow. Okay, is this, is this somewhat making sense? I, I, I wanna, yeah, okay. Is, is, this, is this, I can go more technical if people want. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. <laughs> okay, so th that's a little bit about our uh, place in our galaxy. Uh, amazingly, we are just beginning to understand this. You know, I mean, it, it was only about 100 years ago that people like Harlow Shapley were, were trying to actually map out what sort of a galaxy we were in. And uh, now for the first time, really in the last 10 years, we have a sense of that. Galaxies, do not go through space alone. In fact, we are always in clusters of one kind or another. And this is a, a lovely Hubble picture. Um, Hubble just has these gorgeous images these days where you know, there's a beautiful spiral galaxy in the center, but all of these fuzzy blobs are, are galaxies associated with this larger one, uh, or farther away galaxies. You see sort of these edge-on spirals here that are in the same cluster. 
the history of observing how galaxies cluster and what this might mean about the universe as a whole is something that I've had a little bit of a, of a personal chance, even my you know, 15 years or so as being an astronomer, to watch un unravel. Um, Galaxies also collide, by the way. I mean, if they're in clusters, and there's a lot of gravity associated with a big galaxy, uh, they are always interacting, always colliding. Uh, you've probably heard that the Andromeda galaxy, the nearest large galaxy to us, is coming right at us. It'll hit us in about four billion years. But this appears to be the normal way that galaxies evolve. Um, as you look farther and farther out in space, and they're therefore farther back in time, uh, we see much smaller galaxies, and the galaxies are just colliding and coalescing into bigger and bigger things. How exactly that works is going to tell us about something very mysterious called dark matter. So there's some colliding galaxies, and um, this is just kind of a fun little aside. It turns out that we're colliding with a galaxy right now, and we never even knew it. This is something we learned from our infrared surveys. The blue stars on this represent the stars of the Milky Way galaxy. And we noticed that if you look at the, the motion of stars in the sky, th there's, this, there's this weird stream of kind of ripped off stars. And we believe that's actually from the, the Milky Way absorbing the core of a smaller galaxy that's now almost fully combined with us. It's called the Canis Majoris Dwarf. And uh, the fun thing, so here, here's the sun. Um, the sun, the position of the sun is actually quite near some of these strips of stars that were ripped off this other galaxy. Um, in the night sky, we're actually po probably closer to stars from another galaxy than we are to the center of our own galaxy. It's kind of a neat idea. Look up in the sky, not all those stars are from the Milky Way originally. All right, here, here's where things started to get a little bizarre. Um, this is a real, actual image that has not been altered in any, in any way other than the usual uh, cleaning up of images. This is the, an image of a distant galaxy cluster. And you can recognize some galaxies are looking you know, pretty normal. That's kind of a spiral-looking galaxy. Got some edge-on spiral galaxies. But there's these weird sort of drawn-out arcs here everywhere, that there's this sort of these smeared out images. You see some down here as well. Um, that's real, actually. That, that, that's, like I said, that's not the image being artificially distorted. That's actually what you observe directly in space. And um, it, it, when doing close observations of these weird smeared out uh, shapes, we realized that they were, in fact, normal galaxies. They looked exactly the same. They had the same type of spectral lines. There was nothing unusual about them. Uh, this, you know, this weird line that you see here is actually just a normal spiral galaxy, but the light is being lensed. The light is being smeared out. And what's happening, this is actually, you know, one of the reasons we, we love Einstein so much. General relativity predicts that gravity itself can bend space. And because light has to travel through space, it gets bent along with it. This is what we call a gravitational lens. There's so much gravity associated with this cluster of galaxies that little galaxies behind it, as the light passes by this, this closer cluster of galaxies, the light is bent into these arcs. Uh, using Einstein's equations, that allowed us to estimate the mass present in the cluster of galaxies. And um, the dark matter was discovered in a number of different steps, but the problem was that when we actually did those calculations, it's not even close to the material you observe through light. You know, there, there's something like 75% more matter. Well, no, I'm not saying that the right way. There's something like, you know, 300% times more matter uh, than you would expect. It, it's really, really huge. And uh, this got us thinking about there being a form of matter that was different than anything we'd ever experienced before, something called dark matter. The Milky Way rotates about, where we are, it rotates about once every quarter billion years. We go around the center. And the stars out where we are are already moving so fast, we should have flown off the Milky Way. We should have escape velocity. Something binds the galaxy together gravitationally. Reminds me of a Star Wars quote, you know, it did binds the galaxy together. Uh, the force. And, uh, but anyway, so, you know, d d dark matter is something that is directly observed. Now, when you look at how much things are, are distorted, how many of these little gravitational arcs form, uh, you often see patterns. This is actually a, a pattern of a colliding galaxy. And I'm going to try to remember how this works, whether it's the red or the blue. It's probably, it's probably the, the blue. Uh, two galaxies collided. And we, we've sort of mapped where we see more gravitational arcs. So I think that's sort of out where the blue area is. And there's sort of fewer gravitational arc effects here, more on the outside. 
pick images like the, 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 so the this is actually not, the, this is a, a false colored image. We're actually just color coding where we see more gravitational lensing and less gravitational lensing. Um, it, it's led us to believe that dark matter can actually get stripped away from galaxies. It's something you can kind of play with. You can shape it, you can bend it. And the reason it gets stripped from galaxies is that when two galaxies collide, regular matter kind of sticks. You know, there are cross sections, particles interact with each other. But dark matter just slips right on by, as if there's nothing really there. Dark matter is very, very strange stuff. We can actually prove that it is not made of atoms. It's not made of the stuff that our matter is made of. But yet it exerts gravitational force. So our whole idea of what the universe is made of is changing based on these observations of gravitational arcs. OK, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, <laughs> about observing galaxy clusters, and again, some hints at what this mysterious dark matter may be. Um, this, this, this is a, a wonderful man. Th this is uh, Dr. John Huckra. He was one of my advisors when I was an undergrad at Harvard. And uh, I don't know if any of you know him. He, he, uh, he is a wonderful man. Unfortunately, he died last year rather unexpectedly, so I, I really miss him. When I was in college, uh, John was making maps like this. Now, I'll describe what this is. The position of the Earth is right here. And, and this is looking out into space uh, in this case, you have many, many uh, thousands of light years, well, many, many millions of light years. And every little dot on this graph is a galaxy. And he noticed that the galaxies do not appear to be randomly distributed. You know, galaxies are not just randomly distributed through the sky. They seem to form these weird structures. In fact, there's sort of a big sheet of galaxies, a big wall. I mean, you're looking at a, a sort of a two-dimensional slice through it here. But over time, uh, John made better and better maps. And uh, soon the maps were getting way far out, you know, in, in this case, billions of light years away. And these, these interesting filaments were, were, were seen. So every little speck of light here is, is an individual galaxy. And that they seem to be forming some sort of very, very large structure. In some cases, these structures are so huge that uh, the, the, the look back time is so, you know, the, the look back time meaning if you try to look that far out in space, it took that long for light to get here. When you look at something 10 billion light years away, you have to see it as it was 10 billion years ago. In some cases, we're up against there being no stars to see that far away <laughs> because there weren't any that long ago. So it's very hard to map this, this giant structure. So somewhere in the, in the very center of this map is our local group of galaxies, you know, in the Virgo cluster that we're part of. And then the, the, this is this, this strange shaping of, of the galaxies as you go outward. This is a simulation actually done by a supercomputer. And we're trying to see how dark matter may influence the formation of galaxies and how galaxies cluster together in the sky. And assuming a certain amount of dark matter, these are the kinds of shapes that you get. Uh, the, the galaxies you can sort of see as, you know, there's a sort of a big galaxy here, all of the bright spots, but you'll notice these sort of filaments in the clustering. And we, we also have noticed over time the, that galaxies don't appear to stay still on the structure. They tend to kind of leak inward. And so you, you get a lot more mass at sort of these points where all the webbing comes together, where all these little strands of galaxies come together. And these galaxies just start growing and eating up more and more little galaxies. We did, uh, we did an animation of this. Let me uh, run that. So uh, here's, you know, this is a supercomputer simulation of uh, those, those filaments and, and, and galaxies gradually moving down the filaments and being attracted to the, 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 the sort of the cores, the nexus of these filaments. And you get bigger and bigger galaxies forming. We see huge galaxies, in some cases thousands of times the mass of the Milky Way sitting at the core, uh, the, the, the center of these filaments. That they're called cluster dominant galaxies, CD galaxies. So over time, you know, th there's this large structure to the universe, this large web, this filamentary structure. And we don't think that there's been enough time in the, the age of the universe for galaxies to form that big of a structure from little bits of dust going, you know, little gravitational attracting to bigger and bigger things. That structure had to have somehow been there intrinsically in the universe, even from the beginning. And uh, this is a, another little animation. It, it's, it's very conceptual. But in, we're, we're starting to think of dark matter as being sort of the, the, the landscape, the, the, the topography of the universe gravitationally. And everything that we know of, all of the galaxy clusters, are formed by that landscape. Gravity directs things into these little streams and filaments. In a real way, dark matter isn't so much missing matter, but a mysterious landscape of gravity that may have existed in the universe 
ever since the beginning. That's the question. Where did this come from? In some people, and I'll, I'll sort of wrap up on this uh, at the end of my next little section, some people think that we may not be looking at gravity coming from our universe. There may be other universes, and gravity alone is a force that may leak between the universes. And so maybe this shape, this landscape of our universe, is influenced by other universes out there. How's that for a mind-blowing afternoon? I, I love that, yeah. So, so that, that's what dark matter is. We have all of these direct observations of way too much gravity in the universe. Something is holding galaxies together. Something is warping the light. We get these arcs. Something is forming these giant filaments and directing galaxies how to form. And uh, that, whatever that is, it, it emits no radiation whatsoever. Even very cold, thin gas would emit radio wavelengths. This stuff is truly dark. It's not made of the same stuff we're made of. OK, now I wanted to uh, switch to that, to something in many ways completely unrelated, but this, don't tell the public this dark energy. Uh, dark energy has, un the, the name for both cases means dark means we know nothing about it. We're completely clueless. But uh, dark energy is something that may also be influencing the way the universe forms. And uh, well, actually, I've got, I've got plenty of time. I was making sure I wasn't taking too long. But um, the way this started was a very simple question. How quickly is the universal expansion slowing down after the Big Bang? We, the universe began with this, this explosion about 13.7 billion years ago. And galaxies have a lot of gravity. So over time, the gravitational attraction between galaxies should start to slow down the Big Bang. That made a lot of sense. Now, in order to measure that, how much the Big Bang is slowing down over time, we need to look very far away, very far back in time, and see how fast galaxies were flying apart, say, 10 billion years ago, and compare it to how fast they're moving today. So you know, how has the expansion rate of the universe changed over time? Now, the problem with measuring distances in astronomy is you know, that you're obviously not going to be getting any kind of a ruler out. There's no direct measurement. You need to find something called a standard candle, something that you understand intrinsically how bright this object is, so that if you see it very far away, you can estimate how far away it must be. It's, it's a classic physics technique. I mean, all of you guys are familiar with the inverse square law. The light drops off with the, uh, the, the, the square of the distance. So what we needed here is we needed something that we knew exactly how bright it was very far away. And there's a type of dying star called a, a supernova, uh, stars that are a couple times the mass of the sun. Instead of unraveling very gently like we saw in that beautiful planetary nebula, they actually explode violently. And among supernovae, there's a certain type where you always have pretty much the same brightness. And uh, what happens is that there's, there's a binary star, two stars going around each other. And one star dies and becomes a neutron star, a very, very dense, dead core of a star. Neutron stars are amazing, by the way. Uh, a, a cubic centimeter of neutron star material has about as much mass as Mount Everest. Mount Everest crushed into a, a keyboard key. That, that, that's the density of an entire star, uh, although these things are only about 10 miles across. Really, really wonderfully weird things. Um, so if you have a binary star and you have one of these dead neutron stars, the gravity will start to attract gas off its, off its sister star until eventually the neutron star blows up when it has exactly enough mass to become a supernova explosion. It always happens right at that moment. There's a neutron star, and then, and then there's a moment when, blam, it blows up. And these types of supernovae are pretty much all the same brightness. So our, our technique was to look for this type of supernova in very distant galaxies. These are all really kind of, kind of bad-looking images of very far away galaxies, and we've identified this type of supernovae. So knowing how bright that supernova is, we know roughly how far away that galaxy is. And uh, it got to be pretty interesting. I mean, the, the Hubble Space Telescope can see wonderfully distant galaxies. So I mean, th this is a, a, a distant supernova in the Hubble deep field. I love these deep field images. The Hubble Space Telescope takes these images, and every single little blob you see here is an entire galaxy. It's not a star. It's a whole galaxy. And statistically speaking, if you, uh, if you take a, a quarter and you hold it at arm's length and you look at the eye of George Washington, we, we find about 2,000 galaxies in that volume all over the sky. 
So that's a lot of galaxies to study. Uh, if any of you guys are interested in helping, there's a program called Galaxy Zoo, where we ask the public to help us classify all of those billions of little galaxies. Seriously, it's a lot of fun, actually. Um, but uh, so this is a Hubble Deep Field image. And, and, and we now have galaxies that are, that are you know, going on like 12 billion light years away that we can identify these supernovae, these exploding stars. Okay, so in the, uh, in the early 1990s, uh, again, uh, two friends of mine at Harvard, uh, uh, Bob Kirshner and Brian Schmidt, were, uh, were trying to measure these distant supernovae to get a sense of how much the universe was slowing down over time. And they, uh, I, I even remember lectures when Bob Kirshner was doing this, where he would present different models about, well, maybe it slows down very quickly, maybe it slows down very slowly, but nobody actually thinks it would be accelerating, ha, 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 that was kind of a joke. What they found is that when they did the measurement with these distant supernovae, the universe is actually going faster and faster all the time. It makes no sense. Instead of the Big Bang exploding and slowing down over billions of years, something is pouring energy into the universe. The Big Bang is still going on faster and faster all the time. The universe is accelerating. It's not just expanding. The amount of energy needed to accelerate all of the galaxies is unbelievable, and hence the word dark energy. Something is accelerating all the galaxies apart faster and faster, and we have no bloody idea what it is. Um, just a little side note, I, did, uh, I actually worked with them a little while at Mount Stromlo Observatory in uh, uh, Australia. I absolutely love working at Mount Stromlo. There was a beautiful telescope in here with a world-class spectrograph. It actually burnt down about five years ago. They had a really bad brush fire that went through the area, and that, uh, that telescope is literally a pool of glass on the floor. So, oh, oh, sad. Luckily, no one was hurt. But uh, I, I spent a lot of really good, good fun time at Mount Stromlo with, with, with Brian and Bob. Okay, so here's sort of a, uh, one of these diagrams. We, we believe the universe began about 13.7 billion years ago in this explosion. And dark matter, this extra gravity that the universe seems to have, probably kept things together for a while. And there seems to have been a changeover point about 9 billion years ago. Uh, we observed this from seeing how fast galaxies were expanding way far back in time, way, way long ago. And something happened where things began to fly apart faster and faster, and so we call that dark energy. So somewhere between the balance of dark matter gravitationally pulling things together and this weird dark energy repelling, that, there lies the fate of the universe. So how are we gonna figure out what goes on? This is the embarrassing state of things right now, okay? In modern astrophysics, every galaxy, every planet, every star we think makes up about 4% of the energy content of the universe. Dark matter makes up another 21%, and 75% is this mysterious dark energy. The only thing we can directly observe, touch, smell, taste, is 4% of the universe. We're not even made of what the universe is made of. So what does this mean for the end of the universe? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it could very well be that this acceleration just keeps going. And the acceleration force, if there's more and more of this dark energy pouring in all the time, we have no idea from where, it could actually become strong enough to rip the universe apart, rip galaxy from galaxy. It might even become strong enough to, to rip apart matter itself, that there'll be enough dark energy that your electrons won't be able to stay around your protons and off they go. There may be a moment where the whole universe rips apart in a big puff of, of smoke. Wow. Yeah, hey. <laughs> okay, so what are we going to do about it? Well, um, not much we can do about that, it really are ourselves, but we're, we're, we definitely want to study this. We want to figure out what's going on. And we, uh, we, we want to have farther and farther, more distant observations. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is doing more infrared. Uh, this is the Wide Field Camera 3 that was just put up there in 2009, infrared. In these galaxy surveys, uh, infrared is actually, you can actually see farther out in the universe using infrared light. So invisible light, there's actually nothing really in this little box. But in the infrared, they found this tiny little distant galaxy. Some of these galaxies are, are, are now going on over 12 billion light years away. You know, very, very far away. 
And, uh, and that's why we want to do things like build the James Webb Space Telescope. I know all of you guys have been hearing about this in the news, and you know, I know there's a bill trying to go through Congress right now that has the title, you know, how to get NASA out of Earth science and do more what they should be doing, you know, and there's one to cancel the, uh, the Hubble's, the, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. Politically, this thing has become a bit of a, uh, a millstone, but it, it, is, it, will, it will really help us answer these questions as to where the universe is going and how much dark matter and dark energy will affect that. Uh, this actually is a, a little bit of a model here. Uh, the Hubble Primary Mirror, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope has over seven times the, the, the collection area of the Hubble. And that means we'll be able to see much, much farther back in time, much, much farther out in space. So right now, James Webb is still our next best project to, uh, to try to figure out where all this dark matter and dark energy is going. Now, there is an observation even farther away than all of that. And uh, this is actually an all-sky map in microwaves. Uh, the, these are two globes. They're slightly different perspectives. If you place yourself at the center of each of these, these spheres and sort of look out in all directions, um, this is how we map the sky. Uh, this is a, a microwave emission, and uh, it, it, it's a, it, it corresponds to about 2.7 degrees Kelvin, 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. Very, very cold. And the color coding, the red dots and sort of the blue areas, the red is hotter and the, the blue is a colder area, but the difference between the two is only a millionth of a degree, Kelvin. So we see this, this radiation coming from all over the sky, and we now know that the radiation is coming from about 13.7 billion light years away. This is an afterglow. This is the leftover warmth from the Big Bang itself. And uh, to give you a sense of how this was, was, was seen and what the discovery of this meant, uh, there was a Nobel Prize awarded, the only Nobel Prize I've, I've ever heard that was awarded for somebody discovering that something wasn't pigeon poo. I, I'm, I'm not kidding, I'll explain what this is. Um, yeah, this is actually Penzias and Wilson. Uh, in the 1960s, they were working for Bell Labs, and uh, they were actually working on like satellite communication, some of the first pre-runners of that, and there was a big microwave antenna and everywhere they looked in the sky, there was this noise. There was this kind of hissing noise, very, very low energy. And they figured it had to be pigeon poo. Uh, pigeon poo actually has a dipole molecule in it that gives off microwave and radio emission. And so they went in, and they scraped off all the pigeon poo, and they actually put pigeon traps out. And this particular pigeon trap, you can see in the Air and Space Museum uh, on the National Mall, seriously. So you can, you can see this famous pigeon trap. Um, they couldn't make the radiation go away. They couldn't make the hissing, the noise go away, and they realized they'd actually found something. And this had been predicted. It had been predicted that the Big Bang would have left behind some residual heat, and that's exactly what they found. Um, John Mather, who works at Goddard Space Flight Center, got the no 2007 Nobel Prize for it. Um, he actually was on uh, the, the project scientist for the team that did the COBE spacecraft. So there's a model in back of John here, the Cosmic Microwave Background Explorer. And they did these wonderfully accurate measurements. Uh, there's a, a black body curve showing you the, the beautiful temperature that they're, they're measuring for this radiation. And there's John uh, and his wife uh, getting their, well, he's getting the Nobel Prize. That's the, uh, I guess, the, 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 the Swedish royal family. Yeah. <laughs> So there, he's, he's, he's the nicest Nobel Prize winner I've ever met, actually. Um, he never says, my Nobel Prize. He's very much aware that as the lead of a team at NASA, it was our Nobel Prize. He always says, NASA's Nobel Prize, our Nobel Prize. Really nice guy. This is actually what we're measuring. Uh, we have a new, uh, more sensitive uh, uh, satellite called WMAP, the Wilkins WMAP, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. Anisotropy is a fancy word meaning it, 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 there, there are variations in it. It's not all smooth. And to give you a sense of what we're looking at, we think that this radiation came about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, and it gives us clues about what went on at the very beginning of the universe. There were no stars or any large stru structure at that point, no stars, no galaxies. We can actually look back to a time, 13.7 billion years ago, where all that existed was hydrogen and helium at almost exactly the same temperature. We can see that. We can look back to that time. What we didn't expect was the complexity of variations. You know, something about the Big Bang created th these wonderful patterns of variations. Uh, this is about, like I said, about well before the first stars. You know, the, the, the stars probably came about 400 million years after the Big Bang. 
And then we're looking at all of the development of galaxies and clustering, and now we're wondering about dark energy and whether things will start accelerating. But we can look back to, this is actually the farthest you'll ever be able to see with a telescope. Because we believe that this radiation was released the moment the universe became transparent to light. If you look any farther back in time, the universe was so dense and so hot that it was actually opaque. So this is the farthest back you can possibly look using light. What we're seeing in this microwave background is curious. Um, it should be very, very smooth. And some of these variations are, are, are really very, very simple physics. They actually correspond to acoustic waves, sound waves, going through the medium of the whole universe at that point, going through the hydrogen gas. But there are these dark areas. There's, there's this big cold area right here that is not well explained by our models of the Big Bang. And this shouldn't surprise us, because all of our ideas about how the universe began, the Big Bang, comes from our understanding of the matter, the regular matter, 4% of the universe. 96% of the universe was doing something we don't understand at the beginning. And some people are wondering whether these dark voids may signal another universe interacting with our own. And I put this up just for fun. Don't worry about it. We're talking about, we're, we're talking about 21 dimensions. We're talking about space and time being the same thing. We're talking about multiple dimensional cosmic particles, two universes colliding to set off the Big Bang. It, 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 it keeps, keeps us off the streets. But at, at any rate, it's, um, you know, it, it's... It's led us to some very interesting conjectural thinking. And uh, you may hear some exciting scientific news, not so much of the large-scale cosmology this year, but things coming out from the very, very tiny scale. Uh, these are pictures from CERN, uh, the world's best particle accelerator, uh, over in Switzerland and France. And uh, here's an aerial view of the, of the very large ring of, of the particle collider. Uh, they recently put online something called the Large Hadron Collider, the most powerful collider in the world. Uh, we're hoping it'll have the, the capability to make artificial black holes. Woohoo! So don't worry, that no danger at all from them. Totally safe. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. I, I, actually, I, actually wrote, uh, I actually wrote a column for NFL.com, NationalFootballLeague.com. They, they, they somebody had snarkily said that they were worried about this creating a little black hole and disrupting the football season. And I, um, <laughs> I wrote back proving to them that these were perfectly safe. But the Large Hadron Collider may actually give us a taste of what this dark matter really is. We're going to be looking for dark matter particles. We're going to be looking for things we've never seen. And part of that is we're looking for something called the Higgs particle, the Higgs boson, it's called, which we believe is the particle responsible for carrying mass. Think about that. I mean, you guys all know Einstein's equation equals mc squared. Energy and mass are really sort of two forms of the same thing, but they seem very different to us. Mass is solid stuff. You know, we're, we're solid here. But of course, that's, that's an illusion. There's a particle that carries the property of mass understanding more about it and hopefully finding it. By the way, we, we think we found it. Um, so it, uh, <laughs> they're, they're obviously not going to announce it until they have a really, really good statistical detection. But I, I think that's coming soon. OK, so that, that, that's really about it for me. I guess, uh, oh, sorry. I, I, I could maybe take some questions. Or I, I even have, I have plenty more things I could talk to you about. But what I wanted to do is give you a sense and I'm, I'm hoping that you know, your, your, your brethren astronomers are, are maybe not so crazy for coming up with some of these ideas, like 96% of the universe is made out of something we're not even sure what it is. We have no idea what it is. There are very, very strong observational reasons for modern cosmology having gone that way. It, it may be possible that we have it all wrong. Uh, there is a sizable fraction of people, and, and we're not talking crankpots here, that wonder if what we're looking at is a modification to Einstein's laws of gravity. Maybe if we keep seeing more gravity than there should be, we don't actually have the intrinsic law of gravity right yet. Maybe dark energy, maybe the reason things are flying apart at larger and larger scales is because gravity may work differently at, at large scales as opposed, as opposed to smaller scales. Um, is it possible that instead of all these weird forms of dark matter and dark energy, we need a new theory of gravity.